But you know, I asked God, I said, God, I, I need you to give me something that will encourage our people. And he began to just continually, the Spirit just continually kept bringing up to, in my mind, a devotion that I, I gave to our prayer matters last Tuesday. And those, in, those of you that are in prayer matters, you may hear some things you heard the other day, but I hope that's okay. Because that's what God put on my heart uh, to encourage you with today. It's very encouraging to me that no, to know that God never fails us. That God is always with us. Now, I don't know exactly how long this sermon is. I had a couple of people say, well, Brother Steve's preaching. It's going to be a short message today <laughs> since he had such short notice. Well, we'll see how the Spirit works in that. But um, I do want to begin uh, this message with this particular passage, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 18, kind of as a springboard, if you will, uh, to what we're going to talk about today. Uh, the title or the message title is, What Do You Know? What do you know? And we're going to have three points in that in just a little bit. But I want you to, to uh, note this particular verse. You've heard it all of your life, but it's so valuable and so, uh, so very intricate in your Christian walk today. It says, But grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ, our, our, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, to Him be the glory both now and forever. And everybody said, Amen. Now there is a word there, but grow in the grace and knowledge. We need to know more about God today than we did yesterday. We need to know more about God tomorrow than we know today. Now I know we're not promised tomorrow, but if we get there, we need to know more about God tomorrow, right, than we do today. So it's important that we, we find ourselves in our Christian lives growing in grace and knowledge. By the way, aren't you grateful for grace? Aren't you grateful for God's mercy? Not giving us what we do deserve. How, folks, that's what mercy is. Of course, we know grace is God's unmerited favor. We are, we are undeserving of His grace, but God is so full of grace that He wants us to, to know Him each day. Now, one of the greatest joys that I have in my life right now is watching my six little grandsons growing up. Now, they're five and under, so you can imagine what kind of uh, uh, energy they have. And um, the two oldest ones, they, uh, well, let me just say like the four oldest ones, the three-year-olds and up, they have learned how to talk. And let me tell you something, they know how to talk, and they never stop talking. I got the privilege of watching my grandson Brooks on Friday. And I mean, it's just, and I change the channel, no pops. But the privilege of watching them grow, just in things like they're talking, watch them grow in their walking. Now, the twins will be a, a, a year old this Saturday. I can't believe that. They haven't learned to walk yet, but boy, they're crawling everywhere. And that's just one more step towards learning how to walk. Watching them grow. But the most important thing to me is that they grow up knowing God. Now listen to me. I want to make a statement here that I think is important. I don't want them just knowing about God. I want them to know God. There's a difference. There's a lot of people that have knowledge of God right up here, but they don't have it right here. And it has to be right here if God is going to make a difference in your life. If, he is going, if you're going to live for God, it's got to be a heart knowledge. I remember I had a, had a teacher in one of my elementary classes, and forgive me please, I don't remember which grade it was, but I remember every single morning she said, I've got something you need to learn. I'm thinking, okay. And you need to know it inside and out. Well, folks, I've got something today that you need to know, and you need to know it inside and out, and that is who God is. And I'm going to tell you, it's good to know who God is. And I'm going to share three things with you, if you'll put that on the board. I'll kind of give you an idea of what, where we're going to go today, the outline. And I know it's not in the bulletin, so if you want to uh, put it in uh, your own Bible or whatever, that's fine. It's good to know someone I can trust. Isn't that right? 
It's good to know there is someone who has my back. And then there's also, number three, it's good to know there's someone paving the way. And we're going to deal with those three things here in just a moment. But to me, again, the most important thing in life is to know God and to apply that knowledge to Christian living. I love what Paul, the Apostle Paul said in Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. It says this, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. Note that, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings being conformed to his death. Now I'm thankful from early on my parents instilled in me the importance of knowing who God is. And it wasn't until I was 13 years old when I gave my heart and life to Jesus Christ that I really began to know who God is. Now, as I said a moment ago, knowing God is much more than head knowledge, it's, it's a heart knowledge. And I love what it says in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, and God just put this a verse on my heart last night. He said, but the Lord said to Samuel, do not look at his appearance or his physical stature, because I have refused him, for the Lord does not see as a man sees, for man looks where? On the outward appearance, but God, the Lord, looks at the heart. So what's the most important thing you have today? It's your heart. Let me ask you this. Do you know God from your heart? Now, turn with me to 1 John chapter 2. And we're going to get started on this today. 1 John chapter 2. My little children, it says in verse 1, these things I write to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Now, how many of you are so thankful for that advocate? Because as Jody's saying, love never fails, God never fails you, but how many times do we fail God? But we have an advocate, it says here, with the Father, who is Jesus Christ, the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins. That blood has been applied to the mercy seat. That's what propitiation is. And not for ours only, but also for the whole world. Now by this, we know. I love this phrase. By this, we know that we know Him. If we keep His commandments. He who says, I know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar and the truth is not in Him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him, in Christ. He who says he abides in him ought himself also to walk just as he walked. So with those things, those verses in mind, with growing in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, with that in mind, I want you to think about these three things that I mentioned to you a moment ago. And the first is this. It's good to know there's someone I can trust. Now, in, uh, in the book of Proverbs, you find some of the greatest verses that, I've, that I read concerning uh, trust. And you find it in Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3, and I'm going to begin in verse 1. It says, My son, do not forget my law. In other words, the words of God, but let your heart keep my commands for length of day and, and the long life and peace shall, will be added to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. And here it is. Is there someone we can trust? Right here. Trust in the Lord with all your knowledge. Is that what it says? Trust in the Lord with all your heart. But then it changes. And lean not unto your own understanding. How many of you lean too much? Come on now, don't make me a liar. A lot of times we lean way too much on our own understanding. And we leave God out of things. It says here, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Now let's, let's kind of take a journey through the Bible real quick. Now think about trust. Noah, it's going to start raining. Well, what's rain, God? 
I've never seen rain before. Well, just trust me, Noah, it's going to rain. Okay, God, it's going to rain. What do you want me to do? I want you to build an ark. What's an ark? Well, it's going to be the it's going to be the vessel that's going to carry you through the flood which I am bringing upon the world because of sin that humans are doing. And so he said, build an ark. You know, I can imagine that conversation and I can imagine God saying, well, it's going to take a while. <laughs> 120 years. Can you imagine? Now, I'm not sure it took him that long to build the ark, but I know that that was God's time span to wake people up, but only eight people woke up, folks. Only eight people trusted in God. So Noah said, God said, Noah, build an ark. And then God said, just trust me. What about Abraham? God said, Abraham, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your home. You're going to go to a place, and I'll tell you where, as you're on your way, I'll tell you where you're going. Abraham, you're going to become a, you're going to become a nation. You're going to become my nation. So Abraham, leave your homeland. Just trust me. Abraham, I know you can't hear. You're 100 years old. But listen, Abraham, you're going to have a son at my age and at Sarah's age. Abraham, listen, folks, just trust me. Isn't that what God said? Abraham, that son that you were blessed with, I want you to sacrifice that son. How many fathers would sacrifice their son? God, you mean you want me to take my son, the one you just gave? You want me to take him and put him on an altar and sacrifice him? That's what I said. So they get ready and they get all the supplies. They get the wood. And Isaac and Abraham are having father and son conversation. And Isaac said, I see, I see the wood, but where's the sacrifice? And listen to me, folks. God had this incredible plan in the making. God said, I am the sacrifice. I will provide a lamb. And that's exactly what God did. And so I can hear God, and I can hear Abraham as they are conversing, and I can hear God say, Abraham, just trust me. Now Moses, I know you've been in a palace for a while. I know that you were raised in Egypt. But I said, I've got a job for you to do. I want you to go to Pharaoh, and I want you to say, Pharaoh, let my people go. <laughs> oh, God, I can't do that. I can't talk very well. Why don't you send somebody else? And you remember that story. But God said, Moses, trust me. Now, this one I have a hard time with. Moses, I want you to throw your rod down on the ground. Well, that's not hard to do. But the Bible says it turned into a snake. Moses, pick it up! Moses, pick it up! No, oh God, you pick it up. <laughs> <laughs> Moses, just trust me. Y'all see where I'm going? Moses, <laughs> I want you to go through the Red Sea. God said, just trust me. Gideon, you got 32,000. That's too many. 22,000 walk off the first round. 10,000, that's still too many. Gideon, you can now have 300. And that's just right. Just trust me. Esther, y'all remember that story, don't you? Queen Esther. I'm glad somebody over here remembers that story. <laughs> Afraid to go into the king. But God says, You are called for such a time as this. You go. Just trust me. David. 
just pick up these stones. One, two, three, four, five. I did learn that, by the way, how to count. Pick up those stones. There's a giant making a fuss. And that giant needs to be taken down. And so he goes on the scene and he sees Israel just kind of cowering down. And he said, where is he? How could he have a heart to do that, folks? Why could David walk across and face that giant? Why could he do that? Because he heard God say, just trust me. Daniel, keep on praying. Daniel, I want you to pray three times a day. Even though there's been a decree that has been declared, and if you, and if you don't stop doing this, you're going to be cast into the den of lions. Well, how could he go back and up to his room? How could he go and pray three times a day? Because he heard God say, just trust me. Well, we can keep going on. The three Hebrew children, even in the midst of the fiery furnace, I could just hear that fourth man walking in there. Just trust me. You're not even going to have the smell of smoke on you when you walk out of here. Now, isn't that, wouldn't that be awesome? I would have loved to have been there that day. Now, I wouldn't want to be around the furnace because those around the furnace, you know, they died because they burned up. You know, God saw to it there, but those three walked out unsinged. Then Peter, we got to have a New Testament story, right? The winds and the waves are going crazy. The boat's battered back and forth, and they don't know if they're going to make it or not. They see what they think is a ghost walking on the water, and all of a sudden they realize it's Jesus. And Peter said, Oh, it's the Lord! Forbid, come in, let me come out and walk to you! And so he gets out of the boat, and he walks. How could he get out of the boat, even though we know it was just a short walk, folks? Because he took his eyes off Jesus and down he went. But hey, God never failed him, did he? God reached down and picked him up. Why? Because he heard God say, just trust me. What about in the midst of a fallen world in which we live today? What about an economy that is in the tank, that's tanking today? What about in the midst of war that seems to be inevitable in our world today? Do you hear Jesus just say, just trust me? Can you hear it? Just trust me. In the midst of your trouble and despair, Jesus says, just trust me. If you're between a rock and a hard place, God says, just trust me. Aren't you glad there's somebody you can trust? And that's someone is Jesus. Psalm 37. Psalm 37 says this, in verse 3, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on His faithfulness. Delight yourself also in the Lord, and He shall give you the desires of your heart. Commit your way to the Lord. That word way there simply means commit your lifestyle to the Lord. Commit your life. Trust also in Him and He shall bring it to pass. Folks, trust in the Lord and lean not on your own understanding. Number two, good to know there's someone who has my back. Aren't you glad to know there's someone that's got your back and he's going to go to bat for you? Now you think about this. I want to turn to 1 Kings. I probably will not read this entire account here, but I want us to, to touch base with it. 1 Kings chapter 18, and you know the story. Elijah's there on Mount Carmel, and, and uh, the prophets of Baal have uh, uh, raised their head, and Je Jezebel's there, and, and uh, Ahab, and, and it's, just, it's just a mess. And so there's this contest that's going to take place there on Mount Carmel. And it says in verse 21, And Elijah came to all the people and said, How long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him, but if Baal, follow him. But the people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450 men. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, 
cut it in pieces and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it, and I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord, and the God who answers by fire, he said, he is God. So all the people answered and said, it is well spoken. So you're getting the picture. They're to, they're to make their, uh, their altar, and then Elijah's going to make his. So they take this bull, and they, uh, which was given them, they prepare it, they call on the name of Baal uh, from morning till noon. O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, no one answered. Then they leaped after the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, well, cry a little louder. I love that about this prophet. You're not speaking loud enough. You need to call on him a little louder. They, for he is a God. Either he is meditating or he's busy or he's a, on a journey or perhaps he's sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves and that was their custom with knives and lances until the blood gushed out of them. And, and when midday was passed, they prophesied until the time of the offerings of the evening sacrifice. But there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. Nobody showed up on their behalf. But I want to tell you the scene changes, doesn't it? Elijah takes the 12 stones, verse 31, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. Then with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord. He made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two seals of seed. He put the wood in order, uh, cut the bull in pieces, laid it on the wood, said, fill four water pots with water, pour it on the burnt sacrifice and on the wood. Verse 34 says, do it a second time. Do it a third time, and they did that. So verse 35, so the water ran all around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. But notice this, verse 36. It came to pass at the time of the offerings of the evening sacrifice that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that the people may know that you are the Lord God and that they have turned their hearts back to you again. Then verse 38. Immediately, the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt sacrifice and the wood and the stones and the dust, licked it up, licked up the water that was in the trench. And when all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God, the Lord. He is God. Folks, it didn't take long for God to show up for Elijah, did it? What about your life? It doesn't take long for God to show up for you as well. I remember, and Denise, I can't remember if we were married yet or not. You can help me remember this, but I was still working at Wenton's IGA. I was a meat cutter for seven years, folks. Y'all probably didn't know that, but I was. I got a lot of scars to show for it. But um, one of my jobs that I had was to clean um, the, the meat floor, the floor there in the meat. And um, so I would have to do that on a Sunday morning. Well, I was already doing part-time music, so I had church to be at at like 8.30. And so I would go in at like 5.30, and I would put down the solution on the floor, and, and I would clean it all up. But prior to doing that, the Saturday before that, that was a Sunday morning, the owner of the grocery store, and I've shared this uh, story before, so if you've heard it, just hear it again. If you haven't, I hope this will be a blessing to you. But listen, I go on Saturday morning, the busiest day of the week, in, in meat cutting, that is. The boss, the main store owner, comes to me and he says, you're a minister, aren't you? I said, yes, I am. He said, well, I have a guy in my office that needs to talk to somebody. Would you come talk to him? So I took off my apron and I go to uh, the, the bottom of the stairs and up the stairs was the office. And all of a sudden, this big old guy, about six foot six, 300 pounds, comes walking down the steps. And here I am, I'm, a, I'm 120 pounds soaking wet at that time. I'm twice the man I used to be, by the way. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <laughs> and so he comes down. And he says, can we go somewhere where we can talk? Seemed like a gentle guy. And I said, well, I have a, a, a Chevy Cavalier, a two-door Cavalier. We'll go somewhere to a restaurant, and I'll buy you lunch. 
He said, that would be great. So we get in this cavalier. He's got this much room. I have this much room. <laughs> One of the biggest people I've ever seen in my life, okay? And so he begins to talk about what's going on in his life. And folks, I buy him. We, we stop at Sonic because that was a place we could stay in the car. I bought him five cheeseburgers. <laughs> and I didn't have a lot of money in my pocket, but I, I bought five cheeseburgers for this guy, which came with fries, that kind of thing. And he ate every bit of it, and I, you know, I was glad to do it. But he got to talking about you know, his, his wife and how she needed, some, um, she needed some, a prescription field, and he needed some money for that. So I opened my wallet again. I said, well, I think I got like $13 or $14 left, and I gave it to him. I felt the Spirit prompting me to give it to him, and I did. And so not a whole lot happened after that. We go back, and I let him out of the car, and I go back to work, and I don't think anything about it. Well, Sunday morning, I'm there, and I'm prepping the floor, and I've got the, the solution on the floor, and I've got it scrubbed down, and I sit down at, at the desk for 30 minutes because it has to soak in, and I take the paper and I open up the paper, and guess whose picture I saw on the front page? It was that man that was in my car. He had 10 alias names. He was wanted. He was on the 10 most wanted men by the FBI. And folks, he had killed two people in Kansas the week before. And he was sitting in my car. God prompted me to give him that money. And I'm glad God was there prompting me and helping me. Because if I had not given him that money, all he would have had to do was this. And I was gone. But God was there. God had my back. Aren't you glad in the, in the journey of life that he has your back? Oh, listen. He's there for you. He had Elijah's back as well. The fire fell from heaven. Well, let me wrap this up. It's good to know there's someone who has our back. It's good to know that we can trust someone. But it's also good to know there's someone paving the way. Now, one of the greatest parts of the gospel message is this. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. So, folks, we understand without, without question that Jesus has paved the way to heaven, right? Well, Proverbs chapter 3 continues on. It says in verse 6, it says, In all your ways, acknowledge Him. In other words, in your life's journey, everywhere you go, everything you do, always acknowledge Him. And the Bible says here, And He shall direct your paths. Now when you break down that word direct, and you look back, and, and really what that word means is, God will cut a path. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. Aren't you glad He's done that in your life? Oh, I listen, I listen to a lot of, or I read a lot of the Bible stories, and one of them that just came to my mind last night was that, that great illustration found in Exodus chapter 14, in verse 13. Look at, look at this verse. Exodus chapter 14, verse 13. And you know it's the story where the people of, of God have left Egypt and they're on their journey. And um, Pharaoh's changed his mind. He's decided he's going to go back after them. And uh, so they're right in front of the Red Sea and you remember the army of Pharaoh was behind them and they had nowhere to go. Of course, I'm paraphrasing that. And, but you know the story. And God said this, he told Moses, and then Moses said to the people, do not be afraid. Stand still. He said stand still because they were scurrying about. They, they were probably running trying to figure out a way out of this mess. And isn't that the way we do? Don't we just scurry back and forth trying to, trying to find a way out? Did I not tell you that you can trust God? Did I not tell you that He's got your back? But let me remind you also that He paves the way. 
He's out in the future. He knows where you're headed. He knows where you need to go. And he knew that the people, the children of Israel, needed to get to the other side. And so what does he do? He begins blowing an east wind and the sea parts. You remember. And here's what I love. The miracle of all miracles, they walked on dry ground. When I walked in this building this morning, we had a water seepage through one of the doors, and I thought I had, was going to have to go through the Red Sea. I just, I just thanked the Lord. I just said, God, thank you for this illustration today. You just remind me of what you did that day. And it says, stand still and see the salvation. That word salvation there is deliverance. See the deliverance of the Lord. Folks, sometimes you just need to stand still. Stand still in that problem you've got. Stand still in that journey, in that trouble you've got. Stand still in the crisis and just watch Him deliver. So I'm going to tell you, He'll pave the way. Listen to it. Which He will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. Listen, folks, when God does a job, He does it right. When God delivers and sets a way for you, He does it right. And I'm going to tell you the, the greatest right that has ever been done is Jesus Christ came and died on a cross for your sin and for my sin. He has paved the way. And if you do not know Him as Lord and Savior, if you do not have Him in your heart, you need Jesus right now in your heart. And listen to me. You can trust Him to save you. He said He would. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. Not tomorrow, not yesterday. It's today, right now. If you don't know Christ, you need to come to Him now and just say, I trust you, Jesus. Forgive me of my sin. I realize I'm a sinner. And I need you in my life today. Maybe you've wandered away from God. Maybe there's sin in your life and you need to get that right with Him today. I don't know what is on your heart. I don't know what is in your, in your life, but He does. Why don't you just trust Him? Why don't you let Him come through for you today and pave your way? Let's pray. God, we thank You. We thank You. We thank You so much. God, for what You do for us. But mainly, Lord, what we need to know is, do we know You as our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ? So, Lord, as we come to this invitation time, this response time, Lord, I pray there's no moving around. I pray, Lord, that people, Christian people will be praying. And I pray, Lord, right now that decisions will be made as they come to this altar, whether to kneel and pray or come for uh, salvation or come for a rededication or come for church membership, whatever it may be, Lord. This is your time, our time to worship you in this invitation. So God, do a work in our life today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Would you stand to your feet, please? Our praise team is going to be singing. I'll be down here at the front. If you'd like to come, it's open for you. We thank you for joining us this morning at Rye Hill Baptist Church. And may God richly bless you.